Hello and welcome to another episode of the e-commerce coffee break podcast. Today we want to dive a little bit deeper into when you're planning to sell your business. So obviously every merchant at some point in the business life has the idea of having an exit strategy and you should have that definitely, but how do you do it the right way? How can you grow your business and make it sellable? Um, so with me on the show, I have Chris Schifferling. He is the managing partner of GW Partners and founding partner of Sousco. Chris is a renowned figure in e-commerce and investment banking. As a managing partner of GW Partners and founding partner of Sousco, he co-founded a 50 million e-commerce growth fund, bringing a wealth of experience and unique insights to the digital consumer product industry. Chris' expertise lies in guiding businesses to optimize their EBITDA slash SDE, expanding their multiple and improve their e-commerce operations, preparing them for a successful growth and lucrative exit into the market. So let's dive right into it. Hi, Chris. How are you today? Yay, doing good, Klaus. Thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Great to have you on the show, Chris. Chris, tell me a little bit, e-commerce is growing, but the yep. market is a little bit wobbly when you're trying to sell your business. There's a lot of things happening in the background. Give me a bit of an oversight or a bit of an idea of what's what's happening right now. Yeah, I mean, look, you, you, you've you got a market that's come off of a, of a COVID push, a COVID uh, tailwind. You know, through that period, you had a lot of dollars that were raised, capital that was raised to go and find, you know, growing, burgeoning e-commerce businesses um, that they could blossom into something much greater and bigger. Um, and it was in aggregation. So it was an aggregator type model. Right. And you had a lot of those private equity was still kind of, you know, da dabbling their toes into kind of all e-commerce centric businesses. Very curious to see they invested a lot of money into the vehicles, like the aggregator vehicles, the actual platforms, didn't do so much on their own. And what happened? Well, you had a post-COVID slump, um, specifically in consumer. Two-thirds of our economy has traditionally been service-based. One-third is consumer products-based. And through COVID, that flipped. And now we're feeling the flip back. And so, you know, demand for that we saw through COVID, we're not seeing that as, as strong anymore. And so that for the e-commerce owners was causing a lot of, well, drifting down to the left and not curving up to the right anymore. And in the process, you had credit markets start to flip upside down. And a lot of acquisitions specifically in this market are done through debt, you know, and, and debt was getting more and more expensive. You also had a lot of uncertainty in terms of the global economy. You had a lot of uncertainty going on in the Eurozone. You had a lot of uncertainty going on here in the United States in terms of where is this all going? A year and a half ago, every bank was ringing the alarm, recession, recession, hard landing, hard landing, no soft landings. This is going to be catastrophic. And now, you know, Goldman just slashed their chances of a recession down to 15% today. So you had a lot, I'd say, you know, kind of from this from this point historically to about, I'd call it a year and a year and a half ago, you just had a lot of question marks. And through that, it was very difficult for an e-commerce centric business that is, you know, for all intent and purpose, small. You know, when you're even talking about a business that's 10, 20, 50, 60 million, even 100 million, these are small businesses still. It sounds like a lot to an individual owner and founder, but in the grand scheme of things, these are, this is a small business market. And so trades selling your company just pretty much came to a pretty strong halt. Um, you know, and that was, it was actually kind of across the board, not just e-commerce centric, but just across the board, M&A activity halted. And, you know, through that you had slumping, as I mentioned, and then now we're really looking at, okay, you know, if you want to try and sell your business right now, A, it's going to be extremely difficult to find the buyer that's going to pay you what you expect to be paid, even if you have a great business at the moment. You know, that's the other thing that's that's causing, I would say, you know, M&A activity to, to depress a bit at the moment is expectations between buyers and sellers. You know, the Bain CEO was on CNBC, I think back in like April, and he just called it out as it is. He said, look, Bain is buying... We are buying bolt-on companies that make sense for our platform businesses, but we're not making large trades right now, mainly because buyers' expectations are still here, our expectations are here, and we can't meet on pricing. And so that's kind of the, I would call the the most recent state of the market that's heavily affected the e-commerce centric founder owner. Um, and uh, it's not fun, but there's, but there's hope. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's a very interesting situation that we're in there. But I think there, as I said, there is hope. And I think selling a business, obviously, is a long-term game. And you need to have all your ducks in a row to make it sellable, to make it attractive. And you don't want to undervalue your business or you don't want to have it undervalued. You want to sell it for the price that it is worth. Now, that's a very different thing or difficult thing as a small, medium enterprise coming to these 5, 10, 15, 20 millions. Um, you have other things on your mind and you don't know how the big guys who potentially might be interested in buying business, how they think. Um, now, that's something you help with. Obviously, as a advisory, you are coming on board and going into the different parts of a business and optimizing them for the optimal sale. Tell me a little bit, how does this whole process work and where do you help with? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, to your point, and like we were talking about before, you know, there's a there's a lot of tailwinds that are or headwinds that are currently affecting you know business owners and and really across all functions, right? I mean, you know, it's it's not just uh, marketing uh, or sales or you know trying to trying to find you know stronger turnover year over year over year. It's also affecting you know well, what about my infrastructure and the people that I've hired and how do I find really good people and how do they matter to my organization and how do I compensate them? You know. How do I, how do I, how do I set my business up to be more, you know, more valuable across every function? And so that's really what, that's really what it boils down to is it's a really good time, I think, because you've got, you don't have outside forces that are pushing your business into, into a stratosphere like we had through COVID. I mean, I saw the crummiest businesses do extremely well through COVID they didn't need any branding. They didn't need any, you know, that they, they, did, they didn't need any, what I would call kind of technician work, you know, technical work on them. COVID just kind of made them great. Well, we're past all that. And now you've got to get back to disciplines, conviction and discipline and fundamentals of how to be a really great brand. And I'm making a distinction there. And so that's really, you know, kind of what, what we do both on the South call side, which is our growth fund and GW partners we, we get in there because to your point, you know, what are the buyers really thinking? Well, you'll have a lot of business brokers and advisors tell you really just two things. Well, it's about your SDD, SDE or your EBITDA and financials. And um, well, that's about it. That's kind of where they park themselves. Like, do you have really good net income? And it's like, yeah, that's so much, but that's not, that's not what they're buying. Like, so they're buying the future of the company. So it really is about pro forma and about the future. So what does that really mean? And what does that look like? And what do buyers actually care about? Well, through every function, buyers care about specific things about that function. Whether you're talking about uh, marketing metrics, first click attribution, last click attribution, whether you're talking about your sales channels and strategies for those sales channels, they want to know a lot about what's your TAM, your total addressable market through each channel? What are your unit economics running through each one of those channels? How do they affect the entire organization? How are you, how are you sticky with the consumer? How are you having that second conversation with the consumer and really doing things that are truly brand building, right? So, and supply chain is now an asset. Well, let's talk about your supply chain. What does that really look like? That's one thing through COVID that has not gone away which is, hey, it's no longer just, oh yeah, I've got a freight forwarder, I've got, I've got a supplier. It's, okay, well, what about your master service agreement, the MSA with that particular service you know, for your supplier? How often do you visit them? What does your product roadmap look like? Do you have a product vision for your company? And does it all tie into your brand? Are things disjointed? Because again, buyers are all looking towards the future state of the business. And so when you go into each function, it's not just, well, let's analyze what's been done and only talk about that. It's let's analyze what's been done so we can try and get it from, and this is what we do. You're here. You need to be here because your goal is to sell this company for $25 million. If we sold it today in its current state, you'll get five. So how do we get 25 million? <laughs> let's build the roadmap. And this is effectively what we do both on the GW side and the South Call side is we help build the roadmap. We know we've reached that point. Does the owner founder want to sell the company now? Yes. Great. Then we run the process and we take it out to, you know, a tr it's a traditional middle market style process. We're taking it to corporate strategics. We're taking it to private equity. We're taking it to family offices, which have been a, a very big thing over the past, call it decade. Um, you know, wealthy individuals that kind of form a family office together. 
uh, with with you know specific mandates of what they want to buy. So so yeah, that's that's kind of what that's how we layer ourselves into how we help a business go from what I would consider like this point to that point, and there's so much in between. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now. If you want to grow a business or make a business sellable, obviously sometimes money is a factor. A lot of these DGC businesses are sort of cash flow driven and they don't have enough really. assets to really get to the next level. Um, you help with that as well. How, how does that work? How do you bring money into the company to yes. bring it to the next level? Yes. So, you know, on the South Call side as a growth fund, we have a $50 million, as you mentioned in the beginning of the podcast, we have a, we have a $50 million fund earmarked for growth investment. And so we're a growth investment for us means we're a minority owner. So what does that mean? We own less than 50% basically. Um, and so what we do before any of the money is ejected into the company, we fully understand where the use of funds are going to go. Because to your point, majority of cash flow and why businesses get so cash tight is because of inventory. Mainly that's what it boils down to. So that's why in consumer products, you have a lot of what's called asset backed lenders, ABLs, that the assets that are backing or being leveraged is the inventory itself. Um, so that's kind of where most, most business owners get cash strapped. So it's really about, okay, where, where do these funds need to go or should needs to go to, inventory and future inventory for the company. Another portion though needs to go to marketing. Okay, well let's talk about that. Where where are you, where are you ramping up your marketing? Why are you ramping up your marketing? Maybe it's a new sales channel that they've identified. You know, we're having conversations with Target and we need money for both inventory to service Target because they you know, their pay, their, their terms are 60 to 90 days. You ship product and you're not getting paid for another 90. You know, so it's kind of helping bridge from a capital perspective, but then they're also going to require big program. Okay, you're on our shelves, but now you need to drive the traffic to our shelves. And so this is just one example, but so we take a look at the use of funds, how much is needed on our growth fund. You know, we underwrite the business and then we inject the working capital into the company and it comes in the form of what we would consider venture debt. Venture debt, our product is very friendly in the sense that it's interest only for two years. So our growth fund is really more or less an accelerator. We're looking to get in, do the optimization work that needs to be done to get the company from here to here, right? Point A to point C, D, E, F, <laughs> one of the points. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to then in two years time, get the company to market and sell the business Because at, at year three, that working capital starts to amort and principal needs to be paid. But the idea is optimization work gets done, acceleration, we sell the business. And then of course, you know, principal is paid back through the funds. But the idea here is with us involved, your business would normally sell for 5 million with us involved in everything that we're doing with, with this. And this is on the South Call side. It's very similar to GW. And I'll get into that in just a moment. We're going to sell for 25 right? That's a big jump. Like we're, we're not looking to come in and say, oh, you could sell for five. Uh, let's try and get you to sell for seven in two years <laughs> or 10 in two years. You know, we're trying to get it to where it's like, okay, you're at five. Let's try and get you to like 15. Let's try and get you to 20. You know, one of our investments, if we took them to market right now, uh, we just, they, you know, they just became a portfolio company of ours two months ago or less than two months ago. We could probably sell them for about 10, But, you know, we're looking to take them to market in 18 months. And we all firmly believe we have a pretty strong conviction around our, our thesis, but mainly our business plan, that that thing's going to sell for about 30 to 40 million. So, I mean, it's a big, big, big jump. And then on the GW side, we have resources um, to introduce capital into the business if it's needed. We have a client right now that we're working with on the GW partner side that is currently self-funded and can stay self-funded up until about the budget hits a certain point, which we've outlined as far as the business plan goes. Once it hits that point, it's going to need a new tranche of funds to take it from this point now to this point. And that's where we will, the way that typically works, it just depends on the type of money that's needed. In this, in this particular case, we'll actually go run a process like we would selling the business 
to find investors to take a minority ownership of the company. So very similar process. We'll go out there and 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 find somebody like a private equity fund, a larger private equity fund to inject and then own the company as a minority owner to then grow it to like, you know, 100 million, 150 million and then sell it. So anyways, that's kind of how both both work. Okay, very interesting. Now, uh, you gave a, a very good example there between the people looking from the financial side and from the stock side. And then obviously you have the marketing guys like me who are just spending the money and need more money. And a lot of companies, and I have set in a lot of shareholder own, uh, meetings in my life, is there is a communication problem within the company. Um, so basically the different departments speak different languages. They can't agree on the pathway they want to go for. How does the cooperation with you guys look like? So how, who comes in? Who does speak with you? And I think the what you basically bring to the table is you're asking the uncomfortable questions. And, and so how, how does that, how does that look like? Yeah, it, it really is. And you know, this term has been over overused and abused, but it truly is a partnership. And I think to your point, I kind of, you know, let's, let's pick on language for a moment because you're right. You know, typically when you get, when you get operations in the room with marketing, in the room with finance, one finance is speaking German, of course, <laughs> operations <laughs> is, you know, speaking Portuguese, right. And sales and marketing is speaking Spanish. And I think the benefit of us is we speak all three languages very well. So we know how to tie the company into a common goal. We're going to sell this business and we're going to sell it for X. That's the point B we're at point A altogether. But here's how all the functions need to look, and here's how they need to, you know, use the term synthesize or harmonize with one another. But here's here's what we're looking at. It's the business plan. So we need to all start working towards the common goal. But before that, you nailed it. Let's ask some uncomfortable questions. In We got two years. Let's just assume the business plan is two years. In year one, are we going to burn cash in order to gain growth? Because this particular company has very strong LTV. Mm -hmm. That's, again, we're looking at the same, you know, I love analogies. We're looking at the same hymnal together, right? And that hymnal is data. It's all the data and all the metrics of the company. No one's flying blind anymore. We're all looking at the right BI tool or the right attribution tool. And we're seeing, okay, the TCAC is this, LTV is this. And now let's have a discussion about how we want to now, now run the business for the next two years to get to point B. And so that's how we, that's how we work in partnership because we don't come in as, and I've seen this before too, just like you have Klaus, where in those shareholder meetings, you've got the money guys kind of coming in like jerks to be blunt, you know, and kind of, you know, some, sometimes not all the times, but they can get a little jerky in the sense of I'm the smartest guy in the room. And I'm much smarter than the marketing guy because I'm the finance guy. And we do not have that type of hubris or pride when we enter into a partnership with anyone, whether it's on South Call or GW. And we do it in a very graceful way because most of the time, marketers tend to just be very passionate about what they believe because they've seen the results, but they may not have the right data to have the appropriate conversation. You might think Pinterest is our number one revenue generator. But what I have found is that it's actually losing money because the CAC is the same as the AOV. So I'm not going to be a jerk about it. I just want to show you the data. So as a marketer, do you think we could do either A, something different to get the CAC lower and AOV a little bit higher, or maybe keep AOV the same? Is there any LTV that we can try and squeeze out of a Pinterest customer? And you have a discussion around those points, right? So you don't come into it as a jerk to the marketing guy. It's more like, hey, look, I just want to show you the data. I'm not, and actually, I'm not going to just show you the data. Let's have a really good discussion on what we can do with this. You know, we just had this happen. That's why I'm giving the Pinterest conversation because we just had this happen. And the business owner who loved, loved Pinterest looked at this and said, no, you guys are right. That's the data says what it says. So let's let's reallocate all those dollars towards Google Ads because Google Ads is actually producing, you know, a four times mer for the company. So hopefully that kind of explains how we like to work and think, et cetera. 
No, I think it was a very good example and easy to understand um, that you come in as a partner. Sometimes it might be the right questions that help. And a lot of business, they don't see the forest because of the trees. So it definitely helps okay. to have some third party coming in and um, helping you with getting some clarity there. Now, in the regards of timeline, you said it takes about or usually about two years. What kind um, of homework does a, a business have to do before they get in contact with you? You know, not, not, not much, you know, they can get in contact with us and then we can tell them what the homework looks like. That's the good news. <laughs> um, you know, if they, if they want to reach out and they want to, you know, sit, just have a, a good conversation, we're, we're very, and I, I hope you heard in our, in my tone, even today, we're very altruistic in the way that we like to approach conversations with founder. We, we have a passion for founder owners. We're founder owners. We don't use that in our marketing, but we are, we have a passion though for founder owners and, and, and having discussions with them about their business. And I'll talk to almost anybody. And then usually through that conversation, it becomes clear, hey, this probably would be a good fit for either GW. This would be a good fit for South Call. Um, but I almost tell every single person I get on a call with, by the end of this call, there will be something that benefits you potentially through an introduction that I could, I could help make for you you know, to a resource, one of our resources that are just, you have a weakness, you have a need for the company, and we potentially have a really good resource to make a good introduction to, to help, to help you. So, so yeah, no homework needed, man. That's the good news. <laughs> just come yes. as you are and let's just have a good chat. Okay. Are there any specific industries or niches that would make you a perfect customer? Yeah, I mean, look, we're we're my background is in. I actually came from consumer products, as you mentioned before. You you grew up around Cologne. I used to go there all the time for a trade show. It's a big baby trade show at the at the Messe, right? Is that did I say that word right? right <laughs> and yeah. so, um, so I, I I worked in baby products. It tends to come a little bit more natural in terms for me, but I'd say our firm, you know, we've done we do a lot of work in beauty. I feel we feel we love beauty products. We love baby products. Um, we worked with some toy companies before we love home, home decor, home goods. Um, you know, pet is another one that, that we've dabbled in. We haven't really done a whole lot in just yet, but pet ironically enough is very close to baby products. I know that sounds weird, but, um, kind of a bit of the same similar mindset owner mindset. <laughs> my pet is my kid. Um, but, you know, we're fairly agnostic. I think, I think the way to probably maybe rephrase it or re-answer it is not a big, big fan of supplements, not a huge, huge fan of clothing, but we will do clothing for no, we'll, we don't, we, there's a lot of folks out there that are just totally, no, I don't want to touch clothing brands because it's so trend heavy. It's brand heavy, but it's really trend heavy, uh, but we will work with, with clothing brands. So hopefully supplements is kind of, it's kind of the only one that in furniture is tough. Furniture is really tough. Um, so those are really the only two that were, but anybody listening who has a supplements business and a furniture business, we will absolutely chat with you just because again, it's the whole resource discussion. Okay. Makes sense. How do you earn money? So what, what's your pricing structure? How does that work? Yeah. So, um, on the south, it's, it's fairly similar ish. I mean, look, we tailor every engagement very differently. Um, because it's all based on the needs of the company and it's all based on, and you'll understand this better than anybody. It's all about scope and time. That's it. Right. So if the scope is really big and it takes a lot of time on the GW side, you know, we've got retainers that accordion up and down in terms of how much we charge per month. We, we are, we run it like, um, uh, almost like a Deloitte or a McKinsey style, consultation engagement where we have phases. We have phase one, which is analysis, phase two, which is execution, phase three, which is maintenance. And then phase four is the M&A. So that's kind of how we phase it out. And every month in those phases change. Good news, we credit every single dollar back to the sale of the company. So if we work with you for six months and you've paid us a retainer for six months, then we go out and we sell the business. However much you paid us in that six months, is then credited towards our success fee. So our success fee varies in terms of percentage of the sale of the business. On the South Call side, um, we might take a management fee depending on the company. Management fee is very typical in private equity um, or even in venture where you're working 
a little bit more, I'd say, involved like us in terms of accelerator. So we'll take like a monthly fee. Um, and then we actually own equity in the on the South Call side. So that is the bigger difference. We are equity stakeholders with the business owner. We're on the GW side. It's more of a traditional kind of consultation slash advisory towards the sale of the business. Hopefully that makes okay. sense. Makes absolutely sense. Uh, before we come to the end of the coffee break today, uh, is there one final thought that you want to leave our listeners with? Oh, there's hope. There is hope. I know you're feeling lots and lots of headwinds right now. Some of you may not. Some of you may be feeling growth and feeling good, but you know, expectations in terms of selling the company right now may be way off. Um, listen, put your head down. Keep growing the company. Um, there are many, many, many business owners and founders out there. There are masterminds you can get a hold of. There are a lot of people who are feeling the same way, but there is hope. We're starting to finally see first half of this year was very difficult. We're starting to see much better movement in terms of M&A activity for the second half. And then going into, I'd say, by middle of, middle to end of next year, so about one year away, we believe firmly and strongly that the M&A market's going to be back uh, in full force. Um, it's the, it's one of the leading uh, economic indicators. So when you see any type of depression in a market, one of the first things to come back is, is M&A because it's all about the future. So there's hope. <laughs> That's my message. Okay. I hope. Oh, we're on the same page. I totally agree with that. Chris, where can people find out more about you and get in co contact with you? Yeah, so pretty simple. Um, we've got one of those cool modern websites, uh, gw.partners. So not gw.partners.com, but gw.partners. And then South Call is just S-O-U-T-H, like South, and C-O-L dot co, South Call dot co. South Call is the last base camp before you get to the top of Everest. So that's kind of the analogy we did with the whole growth fund. Um, but yeah, so southcall.co and gw.partners. It'll tell you everything you need to know to get in touch with us through those websites. Excellent. I will put the links in the show notes and you're just one click away. Chris, I could talk for hours about this topic because I really liked like to talk about the future and um, optimizing businesses. But for today, the, the coffee break is over. Thanks so much for your time and talk soon. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Hey, Klausia, thank you for tuning in to another episode. Before we wrap things up, I've got a couple of important points to share. Firstly, if you have enjoyed today's episode and want to support the show, here's a simple way to do it. Help me out with that algorithm magic by liking, commenting, and subscribing on your favorite podcast app. And if you're feeling extra generous, leaving a rating would be great. Your support helps me bringing more impactful guests on the show, and it makes it easier for others to discover the podcast. Secondly, I want to talk about to all your business owners out there. Here's a question. Are you tired of juggling everything in your business while struggling with your marketing tasks? Fed up with hit and miss experiences of hiring freelancers or agencies that don't quite get your vision? But perhaps you're not ready to commit to a full-time in-house marketer just yet. Well, I've got a solution for you. Introducing our fractional marketing team. My team and I provide top-notch experienced marketing professionals to become an extension of your business. Not only will they save you up to 50% on cost compared to traditional hires, but they also take care of all this time-consuming, repetitive and complex marketing tasks that have been holding you back. And this way, you can concentrate on what truly matters, the core of your business. To learn more about how we can help you to scale up your online sales with a fractional team member, head over to our website, smart-ecommerce-marketing.com, or reach out to me directly and I'll get you the details. You will find the links in the show notes. Thanks for being a part of our podcast community and remember your support means the world to me. Until next time, see you then.